Good morning, Jade. Before we dive into your book this morning, can we start with giving a brief introduction to the audience on who you are if they don't know you yet? Sure. Um, uh, hi, I'm Dr. Jade Wu. I am a sleep psychologist. So that's probably a, a job title that most people haven't heard of. It just means that I'm a clinical psychologist and I am trained especially in the science and art of helping people sleep better. And so we are discussing your book, Hello Sleep, The Science and Art of Overcoming Insomnia Without Medications, which I love. Where I'd love to start with you is with a statement you make and just let you color it in for us, which is healthy sleep comes from having a good relationship with sleep. Can you share more on that one? Sure. Yes. So the way I like to think about it is, you know, what does a bad relationship with sleep look like? That might be the easier place to start. So for example, I have patients who maybe have neglected sleep for many years and, you know, they're not really in touch with sleep. They're not a very good friend to sleep. They don't prioritize sleep. They don't care about sleep very much. They haven't really invested much time or energy into sleeping better or helping sleep flourish. And so that's one end of the spectrum for not having a good relationship. On the other end of the spectrum is folks who are maybe too overbearing in their relationship with sleep. So they are trying too hard. They are investing, you know, way too much energy and being too rigid about their expectations and saying my way or the highway. And that can also be bad for your relationship with sleep because sleep is not the type of thing that responds well to bullying either. So with both ends of the spectrum, uh, you know, we are in sort of a, you know, we're in a strained relationship with sleep. And when that happens, sleep health simply can't be very good, whether you neglect it, whether you're overbearing with it. And really the best thing to do is to treat sleep as you would a friend, pay attention to them, spend time with them, prioritize investing in that relationship, but not do in a way that's too overbearing or rigid. So that's what I mean by having a good relationship. Because, okay, here's one more thing I'll say is if you live to be 100, you will have spent something like 33 years sleeping or at least trying to sleep. So if you're spending that much time with somebody in a room together, what kind of relationship do you want to have with them, right? So that can be our guiding principle. And when you look at those two ends of the spectrum, we have someone who just doesn't pay attention to it. And we have someone who's really overbearing on it. Which one tends to have a worse impact on that sleep relationship and therefore the quality of their sleep? That I think really depends on the person. So, you know, when you don't pay enough attention to it, when you don't prioritize it, then you end up with someone who might just not get enough sleep. So that's one type of sleep problem is just not getting enough. And we know from the research that if someone is chronically sleep deficient, then they're more likely to have cardiometabolic you know, disorders like heart disease, diabetes. They're more likely to have cognitive impairments or cognitive decline later in life. And just in general, not function as well and not be as healthy as they can be. On the other hand, if someone is more overbearing with sleep, their actual health deficits might not be as severe. So they're not as much at risk for heart disease, for example, or, or dementia later on. But they are living with a lot of frustration and a lot of misery often because they're constantly worrying about sleep. They're working on sleep like it's an engineering problem day to day. I've had patients come in with like reams of paper or like spreadsheets upon spreadsheets of data that collected with their sleep trackers and on their own. And they just pour so much of their mental energy into this thing that should be easy and natural. So I think both are not so great. One is more objectively bad for your health. The other is for your physical health, I guess. And the other is more objectively bad for your mental health. And how do you feel about, you mentioned the sleep trackers. What are your thoughts with sleep trackers? Are they overdone? Are they helping us? Or are they causing more frustration and concern than they should on this sleep journey? Yeah, I think it could be a double-edged sword. So on one hand, I'm really excited about the improvements in our sleep tracking technology. Now we can learn about people's sleep uh, in the comfort of their homes, in their natural environments, which is a really big boon for sleep science. 
And also for a lot of people that I've worked with, I think having a sleep tracker can be really helpful. Some people don't really believe it till they see it, right? They're like, oh shoot, I really don't get enough sleep or I do sleep worse when I drink a lot of alcohol. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of tracking to really come to those realizations and you can have a real come to Jesus moment. And that's what a lot of people need. And then for other people, it can kind of backfire because as great as a tool a sleep tracker can be, it only measures sleep. It doesn't give you any actionable targets necessarily for how to improve your sleep. So it can be extra frustrating. It's like just because you have a bathroom scale and measure your weight doesn't mean you're going to lose weight or you know get to your ideal weight or whatever that may be. In the same sense, a sleep tracker can tell you more information but doesn't necessarily tell you how to improve things. And sometimes more information can be too much information and can make us frustrated, anxious. Not to mention that sometimes sleep trackers are not accurate. Yes. So there are some downsides. So let's talk a little bit about some science and some myth breakdowns, Jade. And what I'd love to look at with you is this idea of sleep architecture, which sounded very interesting as a concept. And you pointed out that it doesn't follow a lather, rinse, repeat pattern because sleep cycles are not that neat. And you talk about how uh, an interesting fact that our brain will automatically adjust how much deep sleep versus REM sleep versus light sleep we get and in what sequence based on what our current needs are, which seems totally different than the chart we all get when we're kids that, oh, you go into this stage, then this stage, now this stage, and you repeat. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, those charts are very useful for looking at sort of a prototypical, like, you know, this is what sleep generally looks like when you're a healthy middle-aged male let's say right but it's kind of like those anatomy diagrams where you see like an outline of a person and you see like all the bones and muscles and stuff inside that's a prototypical person that's not what everybody looks like right it's just the same thing with our sleep our sleep is very dynamic it's not a one-size-fits-all it's not a lather rinse repeat i say in the book that saying that we cycle through sleep stages is like saying the Rolling Stones cycle through chords. It's just like not does not capture the beauty and the, the mystery and the complexity of it. Um, and you're absolutely right. We automatically adjust, you know, by we, I mean our brains without any direction from us, automatically adjust the proportions of different stages of sleep and the sequence and the shape that the night takes. So for example, if you are quite sleep deprived, like you've just done an ultra marathon and you've been up for 24 hours plus and your body just needs to recover, you're probably going to dip into a deep sleep a lot sooner than usual. Usually it's like 60-ish minutes in, maybe like 45 minutes in, you get a little bit of deep sleep. When you're really sleep deprived, you might go right into deep sleep almost directly. Another example is when you're pregnant, and when you're, uh, oh, no, sorry, that's a bad example because pregnancy has lots of hormones that mess up a lot of things. But in postpartum, for, <laughs> for a new mom who is sleep deprived, and let's say she's nursing, so she's lactating too. She's not only sleep deprived, she's growing food for another human being. She will actually have a greater percentage of slow wave sleep, which is deep sleep. Whereas someone who's been REM sleep deprived might be more likely to go more quickly into REM sleep. So it's just kind of like, what are you missing in the moment? And then there's also a hierarchy of if you're generally sleep deprived, your brain wants to catch up on deep sleep first and then REM sleep and then everything else. Because in REM sleep, that's where we clear toxins from the brain and release growth hormones and boost our immune system. Those are like the life-saving types of important functions. So the brain tends to prioritize that. And then everything else gets prioritized according to what, what else is missing. And so you talked a bit about there about how our brain's adjusting for us based on what our needs are in the moment, which is a bit counter to the, the statement we always get, which is, you know, more is better and you should sleep for at least eight hours. And, and I love that you highlight that that number is not the same for everybody. If I look at myself as an example, I typically found that six and a half is a great number for me. 
And then every once in a while, I need a longer sleep, like a full deep recharge. But if I go eight hours every night, I almost feel too foggy, too much sleep as soon as I cross a certain number. So what is this idea that the optimal number for sleep may be different for all of us and the concept that how our timing of that sleep also may be different for each and every one of us? Yes, our timing and the amount of sleep we need is different, not only between you and I, but also within ourselves across time. So the amount of sleep that you need today may be different from 10 years ago and may be different from 10 years from now. And there's a good reason for this diversity because, you know, just like we are diverse in our height, for example, as a species, that allows some of us to reach the higher fruits and some of us to be able to fit through smaller holes. It's a good thing for a species to be diverse, right? So when humans sleep at somewhat different times and for different amounts of time, then, you know, in a tribe of, let's say, early humans on the savanna, let's say there's a hundred of us and all of us have slightly different sleep habits, then at least somebody is watching, keeping watch late at night and somebody is up early enough to string the bows for the hunt later, right? So we, that diversity allows our species to survive well. So that's why we evolved that way. And also if you look at what our bodies are doing in the day, LeBron James and I are not going to need the same amount of water to survive and not the same amount of sleep. I mean, he famously sleeps 12 hours a day because while well, he's working out like at a, at a very high capacity all the time, I don't need that. I'm pretty much a couch potato and I'm a lot smaller than him. So our biological needs differ based on our genetics, based on our lifestyle, and based on what we are currently doing in our lives. So if you're training for a marathon, if you're pregnant, if you're learning French, all of those things will affect what your brain needs to do at night. So one of the biggest things, the best things you can do for your sleep health is to go with the flow and allow for change. So a lot of physical stress and training tends to lead to, hey, you probably should get more sleep. What about mental stress and training? So if you have a high demanding job or you're constantly thinking all the time and you're just come home and mentally you're just exhausted, should you in that situation also probably be sleeping more instead of catching that extra hour of Netflix? <laughs> that's a great question. And that's actually a tricky one to answer because on the one hand, yes, we do need to heal, you know, the burden that mental stressors are putting on our bodies, just like we need to heal from physical stressors on our bodies. On the other hand, when you're mentally stressed, you're also more prone to having sleep problems. So you might be in a weird catch-22 situation where the more stressed out you are with your job, the harder it is to sleep well, and the less you sleep well, the less you are able to cope with that stress. And so, yes, we definitely want to prioritize good sleep in these situations, but also I think one thing we tend to underestimate is how much we need rest. So rest is not sleep, it's being awake but doing something to recharge. So that might be hanging out with friends or for introverts, it might be taking time alone. It might be, you know, catching up on a hobby, doing something creative, doing something that's meaningful or fulfilling or being out in nature. So there are lots of different ways to rest, which is really how you recharge from these mental stressors, because a lot of the time a mental stressor is stressful because you don't have time to do the things that really fill your cup. So in addition to, or maybe even instead of really worrying about sleep in these situations, I would really encourage people to look for daytime rest opportunities. And one of the important things I thought you said about daytime rest that I, I really want you to reinforce for people so they understand it is that true rest is rejuvenating for your body and mind. It's not goal oriented. And often what you have to show for it at the end isn't quantifiable. And when, when you talked about that, some of the things, for example, like what about going for long walks, meditation, mm -hmm. journaling, H how did these help us get what we want without having that, Hey, like put it in the tracker. Yeah. <laughs> we need to hack our way to good sleep. Yes. That's such a great point. So yeah, a lot of true rest is really hard to quantify because 
when you are truly resting, you're not goal oriented necessarily. I mean, I like to do crafts and stuff. So at the end, you do have technically a craft to show for it, but I didn't do it in order to sell that craft or to use it for like a life-saving, you know, purpose. I did it just because I enjoy it and it allows me to be creative, to work with my hands, to smell and see and hear the sounds, you know, that's what it really boils down to is really being in the moment in your body. So whatever that means to you, whatever is enjoyable for you, that allows you to be truly present. That's the thing that really rejuvenates you. So walking is awesome. You know, being with friends can be really great. Crafts, you know, music, playing it, listening to it, reading, journaling. These are great things to do because you know, it, have you ever noticed that when you get into one of these things, you go into kind of a flow state, you don't really count time, you don't really uh, count beans, you know, how much of this metric have I achieved, or, you know, it's not about that, you really just are in the moment. And that's what we're missing a lot of in our modern life, I think. So let's, we've talked about some of what sleep is and some of the things we want to be thinking about. Let's shift, let's talk about insomnia, the problem. So for those listeners who may not have it, for those who do, they really want to explore it. What is it insomnia and how does it progress through what you call the three P's? Yes. Thank you for asking about the three P's. I love the three P's. So insomnia is a chronic sleep condition where, so chronic just means long-term. It's not like a blip on the radar, a stressful weekend, whatever. It's at least a month or three months, depending on which you know the diagnostic criteria you look at of trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. So often people will say, you know, I'm so tired, but I just can't get to sleep or I wake up a lot during the night and I'm just staring at the ceiling, I'm tossing and turning, can't get back to sleep. Or some people just feel like really unrested even when they technically have slept, it's just not refreshing. So that's insomnia and it tends to progress from you know, just having a risk to having short-term insomnia to having long-term insomnia because everybody has poor sleep sometimes, but how come some people develop a problem chronically? So that's the story of the three Ps. The first P is predisposing factors. These are like firewood that you've gathered, but you don't have a fire yet. So you may never have a fire, but you're closer to having one. So these are the risk factors for insomnia. So that could just be, you know, having a chronic pain condition, for example, or having trauma history, uh, or just being a light sleeper, you know, and some other medical conditions and, and life circumstances that may make a person more prone to insomnia. And then the second P is precipitating factors. So that's the spark that lights that flame in the first place. So this might be for some people starting a new job or losing a job, getting married, getting divorced you know, a really stressful bout uh, in school or at work. So these things can really throw your sleep off track. Now, the good news about the first two pieces is that they don't doom you to long-term chronic insomnia. There are lots of people with predisposing factors and precipitating factors who don't have chronic insomnia. Their body adjusts or they make adaptations in their environment and they're fine. But then that's where the third P comes in. That's perpetuating factors. These are the logs that we keep adding to the fire that really keep that fire going in the long run. That's the fuel that we add. And so these are the things that really keep insomnia going. So this is where the having a bad relationship with sleep comes in. You know, if you're too overbearing, if you're too rigid about your expectations, if you're going to bed too early or staying in bed when you're not sleepy, all of these things can lead to your chronic insomnia being maintained in the long run. Okay. And one of the challenges there though, is that becomes self-fulfilling. Like I've got the precipitating and, and then I spark the fire and now I've, it's been a week. It's been a month. Oh, I can't sleep. It's getting worse. Oh, I got to go to bed early. I, I, I've got to, I've got to improve my sleep hygiene and I have to be in bed early and the bed has to be this temperature and I have to eliminate all light. And, oh no, I looked at a blue screen before I went to bed. What's going to happen? Exactly. Like, at what point do, like the, are the wheels turning Jade and we're just, do, 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 and we're making it worse. Yes, absolutely. Um, you gave some really good examples. Those are very common things that, you know, my patients say, and lots of, you know, uh, what I call insomnia identity. So, you know, after a while, someone t internalizes this idea that 
oh, I am an insomniac. This is just who I am. I just don't sleep well. I'm not good at sleeping. Lots of people tell me they're not good at sleeping. And then once you have that idea, it's really a self-fulfilling prophecy because when you don't expect to sleep well or you worry about not sleeping well or you worry about what's going to happen tomorrow if you don't sleep well, that makes you more anxious, makes you more frustrated. And guess what sleep doesn't respond well to? Anxiety and frustration right? So it's, it really, it can be a vicious cycle. So part of what I do with patients is to, um, you know, identify these perpetuating factors, these wheels that are turning too hard and say, and just examine like, well, is this prediction true? Is this worry warranted? Or is this idea even helpful? And if not, what can we do to change that? And how can we build a better relationship with sleep? And is this the CBT for sleep? Yes, it is. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. Oh, can you take people through some of the basics of the CBT for insomnia? Because it, it feels like, I know for me personally, CBT thought auditing in general was one of the greatest concepts that I was introduced to me in my life. And interestingly, I'd never put two and two together. But after I learned to, to some extent, shut off my mind, unless I wanted to use it, I became a better sleeper. Mm. Now I never put, I never put those two together, but CBT in general, I think now in hindsight helped me become a better sleeper. Now I fall, I, I go to bed under three minutes. I'm asleep. Nice. It's almost instant. There's no <laughs> whirly, whirly mind. Yeah. So on that thought, I'll pass it over to you. I love that. I think if you can sort of take the ideas of some other form of CBT and apply it to other areas of your life or have just accidentally have other areas of your life improve, that's what we aim to do. Um, but yeah, CBT for insomnia in part is based on that idea, thought auditing, as you called it. It's kind of to examine, well, so, okay, let me back up and break it down a little bit. So C is for cognitives. That's the changing your thoughts. B is for behavioral. That's for changing your behaviors. So the thoughts piece, we want to look at the thoughts that are making it harder for us to have a good relationship with sleep. Thoughts like, I'm not going to be able to function tomorrow if I don't sleep well tonight, or I'm just not a good sleeper. These things will really get in the way of having a good relationship with sleep. So examining gently, non-judgmentally, where these thoughts come from? Where did I learn this idea? You know, that I'm not a good sleeper. Is it possible that my parents also had insomnia or didn't learn, you know, good sleep habits? And I grew up thinking that our whole family was just not genetically not good at sleeping. Maybe it's from that. Maybe my idea of I won't be able to function tomorrow if I don't sleep all tonight. Maybe that comes from popular culture where we say things like, oh, don't talk to me. I haven't had my coffee yet. Or like, I can't function. I didn't sleep well last night. It's just part of our lexicon, just how we speak. But if you really think about it, you know, if I have a patient who's had insomnia for 10 years and they don't sleep well, let's say, you know, uh, half the time, that's like 150 days a year, 10 years, that's 1500 nights that they haven't slept well. Well, have they had 1500 nights where their day was ruined, where they couldn't function? If so, how were they able to have a family or like hold down a job or just be a human being? So then when we really examine, it's like, oh, actually they function just fine. They've just been functioning kind of kicking and screaming and like maybe not allowing that. Yeah, I didn't sleep. Well, I don't feel great, but you know, I did actually function better than I thought. I would. So examining these thoughts, being a little bit more scientific about it, that's a cognitive. The behavioral is, I think, even more important. That's where we come up with a schedule for sleep that actually makes sense. So if you are a person who needs six and a half hours of sleep, if you are in bed for 10 hours, then that's three and a half hours of insomnia, right? That's just the math. Your brain cannot sleep more than you really need. So if you are trying to force it, then you are guaranteeing insomnia. So we do a sleep diary, we track sleep over the course of a couple of weeks, and we kind of land on, this is how much sleep your brain is producing, and which is usually more than what people are estimating. And we say, okay, if you're on average sleeping six and a half hours, well, let's be in bed seven hours, give you a little buffer just in case your brain wants to do more. And then if people find when they stick to that routine, 
they find that, oh, it's taking me a lot less time to fall asleep or I'm waking up a lot less. Well, then let's try giving a little more time in bed. See if your brain can fill up just a little bit more time and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. And then we hit that sweet spot where, you know, you still don't have insomnia. You don't have insomnia anymore and you are getting enough sleep. So then that's how you figure out how much sleep you need. So that behavior and, you know, other little things like don't watch the clock and, you know, exercise and get lots of light during the day, things like that. And I teach people mindfulness too. That's not officially a part of CBTI, but I really like to incorporate it because it's mindfulness is just helpful for everything and sleep is no exception. It's funny because I, when I was finishing my mindfulness teaching course, Last year, my mentor got, gave me a little bit of a scolding because there was a cognitive behavioral element to the mindfulness. And, and what I want to contrast there for the listeners is in that mindfulness or that meditation side, these thoughts that we're having, we're trying to just let them go. Just like leave falling from a tree, we catch it, put it gently in the stream, let it go on its way. And with that cognitive behavioral therapy side or the cognitive side, which is, is coming from uh, stoicism at it, as its background, we're, we're not letting that thought go. We're challenging it. We're saying, is that thought real? Or what is a more real thought? And, and so that side of the, of the tree, when you have insomnia and we're trying to just let these thoughts go, it almost feels like that just makes them come back, you know, like don't think of the, of the white bear. Yeah. And now all I can think about is, is the white bear. Do, do you get a little bit of that with your clients in yeah. the contrast between the stoicism versus, or the cognitive versus the mindfulness? Mm. Yeah, that's such a great question. And that is a little bit of a tug of war, not tug of war. That's a challenge to be navigated. And I, as a clinician, I don't necessarily give both to everybody. So depending on the person's personality or how sort of how well mindfulness resonates with them, for example, I may just do mindfulness. We don't even challenge the thought. Who cares if it's true, whether you're going to function well tomorrow if you don't sleep tonight? It is what it is. And you could either battle that thought and that anxiety right now as you're lying in bed trying to sleep, or you could not. You could just allow that thought to be there, let it float away on its own time, and instead pay attention to your breathing or instead pay attention to your little toe on your left foot, right? So that's one way to do it. Another, for other people, they really it don't resonate well with the letting go piece. Maybe it, it just takes a little more time to develop or it's not their personality. For them, you know, someone who's like a hardcore lawyer, for example, they, for what works for them might be taking their thoughts to court. Like, what is the evidence supporting the prosecution's case? Is, is that fair? Is that, you know, uh, enough evidence? So it kind of depends. But yeah, it's a little tricky mixing the two because then it can get confusing. Like, wait, am I supposed to let this go or am I supposed to challenge it in this moment? And I always, I usually default to if, if you're on the fence, just get out of your head and into your body. So let that thought go and just focus on your breathing because that never goes wrong. And for people who are saying, they're hearing us talk about this idea of challenging your thoughts, they may be wondering, well, why am I challenging my thoughts? And is this coming down to the idea that you know the science better than me? I always read a different number, but let's say we have 60,000 thoughts a day, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of those thoughts are negative and they're just recurring on a, on a thought loop. And when we challenge it, we're taking that record or that song off of the record. So when it's repeating, we're not getting that thought of, oh, 30 times in the last half hour, I told myself tomorrow will be horrible because I'm not sleeping right now. And it gets louder and louder. And when we challenge it, we dim it or we maybe even take it off the player for a round or two. Is that what challenging the thought is trying to do? I think that's a really nice metaphor, the taking the record off the record player. That might be what's happening for a lot of people who are successfully challenging their thoughts. Well, I'm thinking of one of a good friend of mine, for example, who she's a very logical, rational person. And she's one where if you present a good argument, she actually will change her belief and, you know, go with that. So she had insomnia a long time ago and I've, you know, helped her. And uh, for her, rationally, 
tracking how many times she's actually been unable to function, for example, has provided enough evidence for her to reverse that thought and, and genuinely believe when she tells herself, actually, I probably will be able to function because I've done it, you know, 10,000 times before. So for her, that's almost like reversing the direction of the record, like playing it backwards. And now but playing it backwards is helpful for her. Um, whereas I almost think of taking the record off the player is more when you let go of that thought. Like, it's like, okay, this record exists and I could play it 30 times, 40 times, 50 times, or I could just not play it. You know, I don't have to argue with the record. I don't have to judge it or critique it for how good of a song it is. I could just not listen to it if it's not serving me well right now. So yeah, those are maybe the different metaphors I would use. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy what you're hearing so far and want me to be able to get your favorite guests on this show, please do me a quick favor. Subscribe to the show and leave me a rating. The 30 seconds of your time will mean a ton to me. You were just talking about as well when you were using my example and you were saying, if you want six and a half hours sleep, maybe we have you in bed for seven hours. And so now we're starting to talk about this idea of, ideally I have a sleep log and I'm logging my sleep and I'm logging that I, my time in bed, I think that's what we might call it. My time in bed was seven hours and my little tracker is saying, well, you slept for six and a half. So I think that gives me maybe an efficiency score. I, I know there's a bunch of different numbers that I'm <laughs> tracking it. What are we trying to log and what are some of the improvements we're trying to make in what we're logging? Yes. So you hit upon the most important ones there, your time in bed. So physically, how long are you in bed as like, that's your window of opportunity to sleep. Basically, if you're outside of bed, you're not sleeping. I mean, sometimes that's not true, but we want to minimize the falling asleep on the couch while watching TV too, because that's taking away from your sleep at night. So assuming all that's taken care of, then how long you're in bed is your opportunity for sleep. And then within that window, what percentage of it are you actually sleeping? That's your sleep efficiency. We want your sleep efficiency to be pretty consistently in the 85 to 95 zone, which means that for the vast majority of your time in bed, you are sleeping, but not 100% of the time. The reason we don't want your head to hit the pillow and fall asleep immediately and sleep like a dead log until your alarm goes off in the morning is that means you probably needed a little bit more opportunity to sleep. Like if your brain is so desperate to get to sleep that you have zero awake time in bed that, you know, then you're maybe sleep deprived. So actually when you were mentioning earlier that you fall asleep within three minutes, I was thinking like, hmm, I wonder if he's maybe like a six and three quarter hour person, you know, maybe like a smidge more might be good. I mean, or some people are just that quick to fall asleep. There's also variation there. I kind of cheat when I say six and a half, that's time uh -huh. in bed, not, not not sleep. more like <laughs> uh -huh. yeah so yes my latency should apparently want to increase the latency it's, <laughs> yeah it's red every time i check the tracker oh yeah latency not... yeah should be yeah. about 15 ish 20 ish minutes like 10 to 20 minutes would be pretty typical for how long it takes to fall asleep yeah, yeah. no it's been a while since that it, uh, that was <laughs> that was back when i maybe a decade ago okay. 15 years ago <laughs> i hear you okay Sorry, I detracted from where you were going. So, oh, no, no, no. So, that, that's, okay. Those are the main ones. And yeah, so late, sleep latency, as we mentioned, is how long you take to fall asleep. And then uh, wake after sleep onset or way so is how long you're awake in the middle of the night. And that should be, or I mean, there's more variability there. That could be zero. That's fine. But it could be 30. And that's also fine. And maybe 45. That's That could be okay, too. So it kind of that one's a little bit more flexible. And also that one's the trickiest to track in a way because oftentimes we're waking up and not realizing it. In fact, one of the biggest differences between someone with insomnia and someone without is that someone that is that they might wake up the exact same number of times and awake for the same amount of time during the night, but the person with insomnia will remember it, whereas the person without insomnia will not remember it. And that's part of what contributes to the frustration of insomnia is that you remember every time you woke up and it just feels like such a drag. Whereas in reality, that amount of waking up is actually normal and healthy and fine. 
But if your brain is sort of on the lookout for those wake-ups and you notice and remember all of those wake-ups and you interpret those wake-ups as bad sleep or like interruptions to your sleep, that it feels worse and you have more insomnia. So tying to that with sleep, Jade, is one of the problems you say we have, that one of the big drivers is this idea of arousal. And so we're just kind of getting our energy up. And, and you talk about three different ways that we can have that energy. And one of them is conditioned arousal. Can you take our audience through what are these different ways we get our energy up and why is one of the simplest things we can do for conditioned arousal and, and to help with our sleep being the only thing we should do in our bed is sleep? Yep. Great question. So first of all, I would make a slight tweak to say that it's not so much we're getting our energy up because it's not necessarily real energy, right? It's not like you suddenly gained nutrition or whatever in, in that moment. So it's not real energy. It's really more like getting more wired or jazzed up or frazzled or adrenaline up or stressed out. So I just like to call it wired. So there are a few ways that you can be too wired at night. So there's the obvious ones. Like if you drink a pot of coffee with dinner, then yeah, you'll probably be too wired by bedtime. If you are worried or stressed, you might be sitting there with thought spinning about, you know, worst case scenarios. That's one way to get wired. Conditioned arousal is an interesting one because it's kind of one of those that nobody thinks about, but it's super powerful. So it really just means the brain is very good at putting two and two together. So if you always get popcorn when you go to a movie theater, like every time you walk into a movie theater, your mouth is going to start watering um, and you're going to start craving that buttery popcorn, right? Our brains are just really good at putting two and two together. So if you're often awake and frustrated in bed, then your brain is learning that the bed is an awake and frustrating place. So that's another way that's a vicious cycle where the more you have insomnia, the more time you spend awake in bed being frustrated and anxious, the more you've gotten conditioned arousal. And the next time you go to bed, your brain is going to say, oh, I know what this place is. This is where we get all frazzled and annoyed and frustrated. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy again. So the last thing we should do in bed is to be awake and frustrated. So traditionally, the rule is don't do anything but sleep in bed. And yeah, I think that's a good rule of thumb to go by. I tend to be a little bit more lenient about that. Like if people want to just hang out with their dog or their partner in bed, that's okay. If they want to read in bed, that's okay. Like if they want to meditate in bed, that's okay. Like if you're hanging out and relax and happy, as long as it's not all day long, like for many hours, yeah, go ahead and spend time in bed. But don't like do your taxes in bed. Don't have arguments in bed. You know, don't do things that are strenuous or annoying or effortful in bed. And don't like play Grand Theft Auto in bed, you know, th those kinds of things. And then the very worst thing you can do in bed is try really hard to sleep while you're not sleepy. That's the very last thing you should do. And is that going back to that conditioned? Is that because you're training yourself that sleep has to be a fight? And every time I come into this bed, like I'm going to get into a sleep fight? Exactly. A lot of patients of mine actually describe it as like, all right, gearing for battle. They're like putting on their pajamas and just going like, Whew, okay, all right, <laughs> getting ready for this battle that happens every night. It's like, oh my gosh, that's so sad that sleep could be such a good friend and yet you're preparing for battle with it every night. It really should be a lot more of a happy and like when you go to bed, it should feel like, ah, I'm so happy to be here. I'm relaxed and looking forward to it. That's how it should yeah. feel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about the idea of circadian dysregulation, you know, just jumping right into that very scientific -y term. What is it? And how can we work with light throughout different times of the day and waking up consistently? How do those two things help us regulate our circadian? 
Yeah. So the circadian system is a network of clocks in your body. So you have billions of these. Like most of your cells have their own little clock, and your organ systems have clocks. Your metabolism has a clock. You know, every your brain has lots of clocks, and then there's a master clock in the brain that's sort of the clock to rule them all. And this is called the super suprachiasmatic nucleus. We'll just call it the master clock because it's the other term is way too hard to say. So the master clock kind of orchestrates when you release your hormones, when you feel sleepy versus awake, when your metabolism functions, gears up versus ramps down, and when your thoughts are more clear and active versus relaxed. So all of these things run on clocks, and the master clock is overseeing all the operations. And your master clock can do its job best when it knows what time it is. And it cannot tell what time it is just on its own because your brain is a dark, dark cave, and your brain inside does not know what time it is, except through the window of your eyes. So the amount of light that comes in through your eyes directly signals the brain, specifically the master clock, to tell it, "Oh, it's daytime," or "Oh no, it's bedtime," or "Oh, it's nighttime." So as humans evolved, we really only had. Bright broad spectrum light during the day, and we only had maybe firelight at night, so like orangey amber color lights. So our brains still work that way. When we have blue light, broad spectrum light, then our brain thinks it's daytime. When we have low dim lights or no lights or just orangey lights, then our brains think it's nighttime. So to make our master clocks very happy, we want to be extremely clear about what time. It is day versus night, and we want to be very predictable about the timing of that. So, what that means is getting up and going to bed about the pretty much the same time every night, and also getting lots of light during the day, especially in the mornings, and not getting a lot of light at night. So, whether that's dimming your screens or just not being on screens very much, wearing blue light blocking glasses, we want to make the contrast between day and night crystal clear. And that way, your master clock in your brain will be very happy. And when it's happy, it's able to make you sleepy when you're supposed to be sleepy, make you awake when you're supposed to be awake, and do all the functions of your body beautifully. And so, when you think about the hackers who want to hack their way to perfection and everything, <laughs> is, is this one of the ones that's a bit overdone? With you know, I've got to wake up, and in, in my first fifteen minutes, I. I have to be outside skipping, staring into the <laughs> sunshine, and uh, by this time I have to shut off any screen ever anywhere, and you know maybe get my red light therapy and then mm -hmm. jump into bed and sleep in a perfectly pitch black room. For the average person, like where is there some truth there, and where do we say, hey, just get outside in the sunshine during the day and dim your screens at night, like put it on night mode. Yes, I very much align with the second thing that you said okay, okay, <laughs> more,、okay. just because I've just seen way too much of that perfectionism backfire. Lots of my patients have said, "I have perfect, flawless sleep hygiene, and I do this at exactly the right times, and I never eat more、uh, than this amount for my bedtime snack." And you know, they they have it down to such a science that. It's putting a lot of pressure on themselves to sleep well,、um, and what they're neglecting is that first of all, there are natural fluctuations in what your body needs, so you can never perfectly control or predict what's going to happen. And also, I think they're neglecting that just listening to your body and going with the flow. That's also really important. Sometimes, I mean, not sometimes. I think most of the time, your body is very wise and can tell you what it actually needs. And maybe what it needs today is just to chill out, or to spend a little time with friends, or like go for a walk that is totally not goal oriented. You're not counting how many steps. You're just enjoying the birds singing on the tree. That's sometimes what our bodies really need. So there's a good balance to be struck because for a lot of people, they do need a little bit more discipline or a little bit more consistency in their schedule to help their master clock really be on. You know, have a good predictable rhythm. That's you know really important, but we really don't need to make it perfect. And so everybody today probably hears this term sleep hygiene, and as we talk through it, we've talked some of the ideas. But for you, 
We've got misconceptions, myths, and then we've got some absolutes out there. What are two or three things other than what we've already talked about that you think most of the audience should be doing when it comes to sleep? And then mm. after that, can we dive into some of the myths that are just a little overdone? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's see. Some absolutes. I mean, I think we've covered the the good ones, like the get lots of light during the day if you can. You know, that's a really good one. I guess we haven't talked about caffeine very much yet. So caffeine, nothing's a perfect absolute because some people metabolize metabolize caffeine quickly and well and just fine, and they can have a couple cups a cu cups of coffee and be okay. For other people, even a little bit of coffee can, you know, really wire them up and um, they can be very sensitive to it. And also that changes too. So as we get older, we tend to become more sensitive to caffeine. And when someone's pregnant, they are a whole lot more sensitive to caffeine. They metabolize caffeine many times slower. So it kind of depends on our stage of life. But as a general rule of thumb, Probably most people could stand to decrease their caffeine intake because caffeine is fake fuel. It does not actually give you energy because it's not nutrition. It's not sleep. It's not anything that really rejuvenates or recharges your body. It just kind of makes your body push through the tiredness or the lack of sleep that it's experiencing. So your body may be desperately trying to tell you something by being tired, by being really groggy. Uh, but you're basically ignoring that message by just bulldozing over that with caffeine and saying, well, I can function as long as I have my coffee. But what's really happening is you're just repeatedly ignoring important signals from your body and making your body function energy that it doesn't have. And your body is just taking hits day after day after day. And at one point, you can't really make up for that anymore. I mean, what the damage that's done is done. So I think we all ought to be a little bit more compassionate with our bodies and listen to what it actually needs, whether it's sleep or hydration with water or, you know, the other types of rejuvenation and recharge and rest that we've talked about, because I think caffeine can become a crutch and not be very helpful in the long run. And when it comes to misconceptions or even myths, what are, what are two or the three that really jump out at you that hey, maybe this isn't as important as everyone keeps telling me. Yeah. So when it comes to sleep hygiene, let's see. Okay. Here's one. We've talked about screens a little bit in the evenings. And I did mention we want to dim our screens, but some people are thinking I need to not have screens at all. Like I should not be having any light coming into my eyes after sunset or after a certain time, or just like social media is bad for sleep. And I think that can be true, but maybe not for the reasons that we think. So everybody's worried about blue light. But like I said earlier, as long as you have lots of bright light during the day, then you have that contrast between day and night, then you're all good. In fact, we know from research that if you have a good 30-ish minutes of broad spectrum daylight exposure, basically going outside for 30 minutes, then you can use your screens at night for like a normal amount of time and be okay. But I think it's the content and the intention behind the screen use that may really impact our sleep. If we are using social media or watching TV or doing things in order to avoid giving our bodies and minds what they actually need, then again, we're kicking the can down the line. You know, if we're feeling stressed out or overwhelmed or feeling like our emotional or spiritual needs are not being fulfilled, and we try to avoid feeling bad about all those things by vegging out in front of the TV. That may work temporarily. You might get distracted by the real housewives of wherever, but then when you go to bed, it catches up with you. All the worries that you didn't address earlier are gonna come flooding in. All the um, insecurities that you didn't work on might come in, you know? So then that really, you're just borrowing time from yourself from the future. And that future happens to be time that you should be sleeping. So that's why I think you can totally use your screens at night and enjoy media. I love watching TV and doing all those things, 
but make sure you also save time to like process your feelings and thoughts, to connect with your loved ones, to really connect with your body and journal and do the things that really fulfill you. And then when you go to bed, your mind is like satisfied. It doesn't need to wrangle those other problems anymore and it can relax and sleep. I love it. We'll switch directions for a moment. I'll fire some rapid fire questions at you okay. if that's all right. Sure. Uh, what's one of the most influential books in your life for you? Uh, are we talking fiction or nonfiction? Either or, either or. Oh my gosh. Uh, so hard to pick. The Tiger's Wife by Taya Obrecht. Uh, oh, what, okay. one of my favorite books of all time is just so beautiful and haunting. And there's like a dreamlike melodic quality to it. I, you know, I, it almost makes you feel like you're in that twilight zone between sleep and wake. And that's, you know, a, a very interesting feeling to get from reading a book. It's called The Tiger's Wife. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I hadn't heard that one before. I like it. So good. Uh, what, what's on the shelf right now that you're enjoying? I'm reading, uh, this is so nerdy, but I'm actually reading a math book. <laughs> it's called <What>? Proofs. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's about... It's literally just like, how do you prove things about numbers? And I enjoy it because it allows me to use my brain for just purely impractical, like it's not good for any practical reason in my life. Just, it's just for fun. It's just intellectualizing for the fun of it. So that it scratches that itch. <laughs> oh, I love that. What's one thing that you spent less than a thousand dollars on in the last year that Jade has thought to herself, I wish I'd bought this sooner. Oh, that's such a good question. Oh, this is, this is so like trashy, but <laughs> like supermarket sushi. It turns out it's like really satisfying. And like, you can just go in the middle of the day when you have like 30 minutes to spare and just get some like shitty sushi. And it's like the enjoyment to price ratio is just like really high. And you can buy so much supermarket sushi with a thousand dollars. Yes, you, yeah, that would almost be disturbing. <laughs> yeah. We have a, where I live here. We have a lot of sushi. So that would be scary. This show's about growth. So, what's one behavior change, mindset shift, or new habit that you've introduced at some point in your life that had the most oversized impact for you? This one is recent. So I'm a mother of a four-year-old and two-year-old. And to be perfectly honest, I've had a kind of a hard time adjusting to motherhood. I mean, I love it. I adore my children and it's, I would not trade it for a different life. And it's been really, really difficult to sort of lose my whole identity from previous to that and not be able to do a lot of the things that I used to do. So like I started having thoughts about, do I regret having children? Was this like not the good, the right choice for me? And that was like a really dark and destructive thought for me. And so what I've started um, is to think about my thoughts as passengers on a bus. So this harkens back to our mindfulness discussion. It's like, I'm driving this bus and I have my route and I have my destination and I'm driving my bus. That's my life. And sometimes there are passengers that are going to get on the bus that I don't like very much that are not very helpful that are maybe even really rude or mean and i could either argue with them or try to shove them off the bus or like you know take the bus off route to accommodate them or i can just accept that sometimes this is going to happen and i don't have to take them seriously i don't have to like win any fights with them i just let them do their thing in the back and whatever and then i just keep driving and i enjoy the passengers that i do like and meanwhile i've not gone off route and i've you know, I'm still doing my thing. So that's been a really, really helpful framework for dealing with thoughts that I know are not helpful to me. And who knows if they're true or not, but it doesn't matter if they're true because reality is reality. So this has been a nice framework for me. And eventually they'll get off the bus. Eventually they always do. Yeah. Wow. I love that. I love that analogy. So if we look at the book. We went pretty deep, pretty wide. Is there anything we missed that you want to make sure the audience gets? I think let's go full circle and say your relationship with sleep is the most important thing because in a good relationship, you can weather changes, you can weather setbacks, and you have trust that things will always get back on track no matter what. And you appreciate, you know, the other person and just like you want to appreciate sleep. And if you have that 
foundation of a good relationship. You know, as change things change with your lifestyle or health or age or whatever, that's okay. You can always adjust. Um, so instead of chasing specific goals or metrics, let's just chase a good relationship with sleep and you'll be better served in the long term. It's wonderful. And where can people find you? Well, best place is my website. I'm not on social media very much these days, especially after, you know, Twitter turned into X. <laughs> but I do give some pregnancy sleep advice and general sleep advice on Instagram. I'm at Dr. J. Wu, D-R underscore Jade underscore Wu. And my website is drjadewu dot com. Love it. Thank you for joining me today. Thank on the you podcast. so much for having me. This was really fun. If you like the podcast, you'll love our new newsletter, The Growth Guide. Every Thursday, straight to your inbox with the goal to help you be better, achieve more, and become financially free. Check it out at our website, thegrowth.guide. Subscribe and learn more.